starts the discussion on yoga, discussion on karma, then discussion on bhakti, now discussion on yoga. Karma, bhakti, yoga, bodha, that is what the verse number 
ten tulas. Rustavan Rustalevana Swastada. What's we attain is Swastada Abidance. Manaswastada Abidance of the mind. Rustale in the heart. Whether our heart is interpreted as this physical heart or the heart of the things means the core of the things, the essence of the thing. In that case, the abundance of the mind in the very core of the mind, very essence of the mind, which is consciousness. Because mind is nothing but consciousness upon which the names and forms are superimposed. Consciousness as cloth linen or consciousness with a costume of name and form is called thought. Just as gold plus name and form is called ornament. So what is meant by the ornament abiding in gold? Ornament always abides in gold because gold is the true nature of ornament. Ornament can never be away from the gold. The only thing that can create a distance between gold and ornament is ignorance. Of an ornament, feeling that I am just an ornament, just the name and form, and looking upon other ornaments also as mere names and forms, and thus feeling a sense of separation from other ornaments, a sense of being limited to a given name and form. Therefore, in case of the ornament, the sense of separatedness, a sense of limitedness, a sense of confinement is not the reality of the ornament, it is because the ornament thinks so. It is the perception that the ornament has about itself. Because the ornament could very well have the perception that I am gold, which is indeed the reality of the ornament. Similarly, this individual, what you call the ego, or the mind, thinking that I am a name and form, there is a body, sense, mind, complex I am, which is really like a costume, a name and form, which is merely a locus for the manifestation of consciousness. Just as electricity requires a locus such as a bulb to manifest itself, so also consciousness of the self requires a locus such as the body-mind sense complex to manifest itself. But electricity is not bulb. Electricity is independent of the bulb. Whether the bulb is or not, the electricity is. Similarly, the consciousness that I am not the body, body I am not, that is the locus for manifestation of consciousness of myself. This I am independent of this costume. It is this knowledge really that brings about the abundance of this mind into consciousness. Just seeing what is. Meaning that an ornament does not need to do anything to abide in gold. Just see the fact that I abide in gold because gold is my nature. The problem is not that I am away from the gold. 
Problem is, I take myself to be a name in form and therefore I am suffering from a perceived sense of isolation or separation, not a real sense of isolation. Vedanta causes projection. The projection does the same damage that an actual thing may do. Meaning that when I look upon a rope, piece of rope as snake, that perception on my part that this is snake is as much a problem to me as a real snake would be. Maybe because for me the snake is real. And therefore, the fear and other reactions that a real snake would create, they are also created by this perceived snake or false snake or a projected snake. This projection brings about the same effect that a real thing would bring about. So Vedanta says that just because you feel limited, and all my sense of sorrow or unhappiness is because I find myself a limited being. And so, whether if I was really limited, then the sorrow would have a justification. But this limitation is a sense, is a notion. With a conclusion, never all the sorrow in my life, all the bondage in my life is due to this wrong conclusion, this wrong notion of the self or the sense. So really, as far as the mind abiding in consciousness is concerned, the mind just has to know that consciousness is my nature. Just as an ornament just has to know that gold is my nature. But here, that's one way, that's a Vedantic way. But here, you actually, you know, you actually resolve the mind. You actually melt the ornament. So either melting the ornament is a way of achieving gold or seeing that I am gold in spite of the form of ornament is another way. You understand the difference? Vedanta says that you don't need to melt the ornament. You don't need to melt the mind because whether mind is, even when the mind is, it is nothing but awareness. But Yoga Shastra says, no, you have to melt the ornament. As long as ornament is a form, it can never feel liberated. It can never feel free and therefore that form must be melted. Then alone it can see itself as gold. So when all the form is melted, then the gold tree sees itself as gold. That's, that is that's called Prakriya. That is their method of understanding this. Therefore, Yoga Shastra seeks to completely stop all the thoughts. Because flow of thoughts is mind. As long as mind has a form, so long, like an ornament, it can never be free. So they say that having form is a reason for bondage. Vedanta says, that not form, that I am a form, that notion is the cause of bondage. But their view is that as long as there is a form, there is bondage. Therefore, the form should be melted. And therefore, the mind should be made free of all the thoughts. And they will develop a fantastic process of how to make the mind devoid of all the thoughts. Yoga chitta vrutti nirodha. The word yoga is defined as nirodha, stop it of chitta vrutti, all the thoughts of the mind. 
तदा दृष्टु स्वरूपे अवस्थानम योग शास्त्र से जग वैन एट दैट टाइम द दृष्टा द सीयर अबाइड्स इन हिज ओन नेचर मीनिंग एट दैट टाइम ही सीज दैट आई एम पुरुष है आई एम कॉन्शियसनेस सो दीस टू डिफरेंट प्रक्रिया आ जाते हैं वेदांतिक प्रक्रिया एंड द प्रक्रिया ऑफ द योगा द भक्ता है दैट इन द प्रक्रिया He wants to merge into Ishvara, so there also the merging is there. Yoga Shastra brings about merging by resolving the mind. The Bhakta wants to bring about the mindlessness of freedom by merging the mind with Ishvara. So what is Bhakti? constantly dwelling upon ishvara with devotion that creates a moment that the mind ultimately gets merged into ishvara so what remains is ishvara so that is bhakti so the mind completely is resolved and what remains is consciousness that is yoga That even when the mind is that it is consciousness to see this is Vedanta. So you know the difference, the difference in prakriyas, and different people are comfortable with different things. Understand? It is best to stay away from saying one is different, severe, inferior, etc. Is you know, it depends upon the kind of disposition that you brought with yourself. And there were some people are disposed to dwell upon Ishvara, His glory, His greatness, His beauty, His love, His grace, and become one with that. Some people are disposed to bring the mind into focus and completely resolve it to become one with consciousness. And a few people are disposed. to see that the mind even when it is there it is nothing but consciousness the vedantins are always in a great minority understand that so that's all so we are part of that minority anyway but here ramana <coughs> maharshi presents before us all these prakriyas so karma also that by performing karma selflessly and in the spirit of devotion or worship or offering to the lord so the mind completely merges you become one you know that's how you become in light so that's one way bhakti merging the lord mind in the lord another way yoga merging the mind in consciousness another way all of them involve something to do understand so vedanta classifies all of them as karma yoga where karma is involved is called karma yoga therefore vedan all of these are acceptable to vedanta as long as they are understood to be karma yoga preparation for the knowledge preparation to see this fact with the help of teaching soham that soham that brahman consciousness limitless i am <clears throat> so now ramana maharshi is discussing the yoga of merging the mind into consciousness so yoga shastra has developed a whole wonderful everybody has developed wonderful things bhakti shastra is also very wonderful Yoga Shastra also is very wonderful. Karma Shastra also is wonderful. Of course, Vedanta is wonderful. But it is great that we have all these well-developed, mature traditions, and others also. So, bhakti has many, many branches. Whether you are a devotee of Lord Krishna or Vaishnava, whether you are Vaishnava. 
devotee of Shiva, Lord Shiva, then you call Shaiva, devotee of goddess is called Shakta. Each one has its own methodology of worship and very elaborate. Because in India there was freedom of thought. There was no central authority to deter control anything. Or to prove or disprove or approve or anything. Therefore, each one of them independently developed. Not independently, they all had always an exchange with each other also. Therefore, we have so many prakriyas of upasana. Upasana means meditation, mental worship. So, coming to the yoga, vairodhanat liyate manaha. The lie of the mind, the absorption of the mind is what the yoga is seeking. But in yoga also, there are two things, as the text will talk, we will come to that, laya and vinasha. Laya means absorption of the mind. Vinasha means destruction of the mind. So, mano nasha, we will see destruction of the mind. But Ramana Maharshi says that by controlling the breath, you can bring about only the resolving of the mind, not the destruction of the mind. What is to be accomplished is destruction of the mind. Not merely merger of the mind, but destruction of the mind. So we will see. So that was Liyate, that I am just point, drawing your attention in this verse number 11 to the word Liyate. Vairodhanat liyate manaha. Vairodhanat by restraining the breath. What is it? Manaha liyate. The mind merges. Meaning the ornament gets melted. Jala Pakshivat Rodha Sadhana said that this breathing becomes like a net. Just as you use a net to catch a bird, so also you can use this breath to control the mind. Very beautiful thing. Thus they have developed elaborate methods of controlling the breath called pranayama. By which the mind can be brought under control. Wow. How, do you, how is it that by controlling the breath, you can control the mind. Chitta vayavaha, chitkriya yutaha, shakha yordvai, shakti mulaga. Because chitta vayavaha, chitta means mind, vayavaha means the breath. Chitkriya yutaha, they are respectively endowed with the power to know and the power to act. Meaning the mind is endowed with the power to know and the prana, the vital air is endowed with the power to act. These two powers we have, power to know and power to act. This is the third power to will is included in power to know. Both these are powers or shakti in Sanskrit. So both these powers of shakti have the root in one fundamental power. Fundamental Shakti, the primordial power, primordial Shakti, you can call it Maya, you can call it Prakriti. Since both of them, origin, you know, emerge, emanate from the same root or source, therefore, by controlling one, you can control the other. <clears throat> so, yes, last night, yesterday afternoon, we discussed briefly or a very preliminary discussion of what pranayama is, how to control the prana. Rechaka, puraka, puraka, rechaka, kumbhaka. Puraka, filling in the breath. Rechaka, emptying out the breath. Kumbhaka, holding the breath. Holding within or holding without. <coughs> this way, Slowly we learn to control the breath. And the breathing process becomes slower and slower and slower and slower and slower. As a consequence of which, 
the mind also becomes slower and slower and slower and slower. And supposedly when the breathing stops, the mind also stops. So breathing is something we can control. And through that, the mind gets control. <clears throat> so this is, one thing is called murder. So now in the next verse, Ramana Maharshi talks about two kinds of merger, two kinds of resolving. So let us go to the next verse. I think we need the light. That's all you have? Doesn't make much difference to me. All right. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's all right. This is better. Laya Vinashane Ubaya Rodhane. Laya Gatam Punar Bhavati no Mutam. Laya Vinashane Ubaya Rodhane. Where Rodhanam, Ubhaya means two. There is a twofold control of the mind. Or two stages of control of the mind. Let us put it this way. Laya, Vinashane. Laya is merger of the mind. Vinasha, destruction of the mind. This is a technical term. You have to understand it, you know. So this is very... These terms are very prevalent in the yoga shastra, yoga shastra. There is a text called Yoga Vasishtha, which it talks about this elaborately. The, they talk about Vasanakshaya and Manonashaya. Vasanakshaya, the exhaustion of Vasanas. Manonashaya, nasha, the destruction of the mind. Vasanakshaya, and Manonasa. So, what is this Vasana? You can say Vasanas are Ragadveshas. Vasana means a tendency, a potential. Thus, Vasana can be said to be the subtle state of a thought, the unmanifest state of a thought. Thought becomes manifest in our mind. Before that is unmanifest. You know what? Anything that becomes manifest is unmanifest before that. Like an ornament. You made ornament from a lump of gold. When the ornament is made, it is evident to you. It's called manifest. Now before the ornament was made, did it exist or not? It existed. Existed as what? As unmanifest. What is unmanifest? Not evident to the senses. Meaning that in the lump of gold, the ornament is there, potentially there. And what is potentially there is become is become becomes manifest. For example, a seed. In that the tree is potentially there. Had the tree not been potentially there, it could not have become manifest. Thus, banyan tree has atomic little seeds and huge banyan tree comes out. From mango seed, a mango tree comes out. From lemon seed, a lemon tree comes out. Not that you get mangoes when you plant a lemon seed. That shows that lemon tree is potentially there in lemon seed. Now with, with microscope etc. you can even see. When you split a seed, you can see also 
the uh, some rudimentary features of the, the tree also in there. But anyway, the idea is that unmanifest becomes manifest. Not a non-existent thing becomes existent, but what existed is unmanifest becomes manifest. This is what Vedanta says, that's what Sankhya says. I will not go into other views, but this is our view. <clears throat> that an ornament must be potentially there in the lump of gold, otherwise you can't make an ornament. You cannot extract oil out of sand because oil is not potentially there in the sand. You cannot make idli out of sand because it is not potentially there. So what you can make is what is potentially there. The idea is that a thought also is a manifest state. When a thought arises in the mind, then we become aware of that. But before it became evident, it was an unmanifest state. Call that samskara. Call that samskara means impression. Call it uh, unmanifest. So, in our mind, there are many built in tendencies, there are built in patterns of thinking. Like there are channels through which the water flows, you know. Similarly, also in the mind, we keep on repeating a thought again and again and again, then a channel is created. If you do a given thing repeatedly, then a deeper and deeper channel is created. And this created a tendency to automatically do that. Thus, if I cultivate a habit, suppose my posture is not right and with, and with a lot of effort I now create a new posture, then a time comes when I automatically do that. I deliberately think, That this is Narayana, this is Narayana, Narayana. I look upon this person again and again and again and again. A time will come when I will effortlessly look upon that. So this is the nature of mind. That is the reason why you can mold the mind. Because of not thinking properly, the mind is molded the way it is molded right now. What is sadhana? that we deliberately create new patterns of thinking. <coughs> the old patterns, habitual patterns are there. When I see this person, I react. That's a habitual pattern. When I see something else, I like, I am attached, I want. Habitual pattern. So these built-in habitual patterns are called vasanas. So, the basic habitual pattern is identification of the body. We are born with this habit of identifying with the body, taking the body, mind, sense organ to be the self. That is a basic pattern. Vedanta calls a habitual error. And we need to become free from the habitual error. Our Nididhyasana is the same thing. Shravanam. Mananam Nididhyasana. Shravanam, listening to scriptures from the lips of the teacher. Mananam, reflection upon what I understood from the teacher to make my understanding free from any doubts and vagueness, to make my understanding very clear. And Nididhyasana, assimilating that knowledge, that it becomes mine, it becomes spontaneous. As long as I am aware of conscious soul and I am alright, for a moment I become, you know, I am not alert. At that time I, I slip, slide back to my old self, old habit. So therefore, Nidhi Dhyasana means completely correcting the habit of habitual identification with the body mind sense complex. From this vasana, that is basic vasana. Many of the vasanas are created. Since body is looked upon as self, 
whatever is favorable to body becomes also favorable to me. You follow? So other patterns are created. I like this. I dislike that. So ragad veshas are created. Other patterns. So ragad veshas are also built in patterns. When I see something automatically, I want it. I see something, I, want, I hate it. Without seeing, what is vasana? Vasana is a reaction that comes without prior deliberation. And therefore, in our behavior, lots of our behavior is controlled by our impulses, our vasanas. And as long as those vasanas or potential impulses, the potential state of an impulse can be called vasana. Impulse is a habitual response, not a deliberate response. And vasana can be called the potential state of an impulse. As long as vasanas are there, the potential is there, the impulses are likely to occur. Therefore, to make the mind free from impulse, it is necessary that it is made free from those vasanas or built-in patterns. So, this is called vasana kshaya. Kshaya means the elimination of vasana. Elimination of all those built-in patterns which are the potential for reactions or potential for impulses. Vasana action becomes important. So, making the mind free from these impulses of lust, anger, greed, jealousy, whatever, a deliberate attempt to do that is called Vasana Kshaya. And that we have, you know. As long as vasanas are there, as long as those built-in patterns are there, so long thoughts will arise. Like there is a pot on the stove. As long as the fire is there underneath, so long the bubbles arise, you know. For the bubbles to stop, you must turn off the fire. Similarly, as long as the fire in the form of vasanas is there, so potential is there, so long thoughts will keep on arising. Therefore, for just as for bubbles not to arise, we should switch off the fire, so also for the thoughts not to arise, we should switch off those patterns or vasanas. Vasanas are not there, thoughts also are not there. Vasana akshaya, a total exhaustion of all the vasanas also brings about the, the, the state where the thoughts do not arise. So what do we want? Yoga, chitta bhakti nirodha. Yoga is a state of mind, understand. Where there is no, the thought does not arise. Not that you stop the thought. Thought does not arise. Understand this. In the beginning you stop the thought. But ultimately you want to achieve a state where the thought does not arise. Then only you are comfortable. So as long as you achieve a state, as long as you have not achieved the state where the thought does not arise, so long you keep on curbing the thought. Removing vasanas. And the time comes. When all the vasanas are gone, then no thought arises. That is called yoga. That is called asampragnya, the samadhi, etc. You know, the highest state in the yoga. <coughs> Therefore, to achieve what the yoga shastra calls yoga, these two things are necessary. Vasana akshaya and mano nashaya. Vasana akshaya, the exhaustion of all the vasanas or the potential of all thoughts and manonasa, the freedom from the arising of the thought. These two states are required. So here Raman Mahesh says, Le Vinashane Ubhay Rodhane Ubhay Rodhane 
the control or a strain of the mind is in two stages, laya and vinasha. Laya is simply the mind merges, like the mind merges into sleep. They are also called laya. But you know that in sleep, all the vasanas, all the potential remains intact. Because when we wake up in the morning, we are what we were before we went to sleep. As Swami would say, if he was an idiot before, <laughs> after waking up, he remains an idiot. Formerly, he was a restless idiot. Now, he is a silent idiot. But this process of merger of mind does not create enlightenment. This is what Vedanta says. Enlightenment requires to see. And so Vedanta is not satisfied merely by merger of the mind or stopping of the mind. Vedanta says that knowledge can take place only as a result of vichara. <coughs> they do not see the need of that. They say that when the mind thus completely, when this state called yoga is achieved, automatically realization takes place. Yoga Shastra calls it Purusha Prakriti Viveka. Viveka means discrimination, separation of Purusha from Prakriti, of person from personality, of self from non-self. So, Yoga and Sankhya also accept that self is ever free. And the bondage is the result of identification. That is accepted. But how to become free? Vedanta says that de identify. Yoga Shastra says that as long as the mind is there, identification will be there. Therefore, let the mind completely cease. Of the seizing of the mind, there are two states, Laya and Vinasha. Laya, the merger. But there, the potential Vasanas are still there. Just as in deep sleep, even though the mind is merged, the Vasanas still remain. Although, this Laya is not sleep. This, this is a wakeful Laya. The difference between sleep and samadhi is samadhi is wakeful sleeping, meaning the wake that the, the yogi experiences a great joy. In sleep also we are supposedly experiencing joy. We don't know that. But in the samadhi or called laya, merger or samadhi, the yogi is aware of the joy. <coughs> that is why Gaurabhada Acharya says that you have to grow out of this also. Various obstacles that Gaurabhada Acharya describes in the Vandukya Karika. One is called Laya, that is called Vikshepa. Laya means because of Tamas, Vikshepa is Rajas. And Naswadayet Sukham Tatra says, do not also get stuck with experiencing of Sukha or pleasure. Nisanga Prajna Bhavet, may you become unattached by the wisdom, by the knowledge that I am not the experiencer of happiness, I am the happiness. That is Vedanta. But here it is said that. Thus, when the mind attains the state of asampragnya, the samadhi called yoga, then the realization takes place. <coughs> so, lay vinashane uhairodhane. There is this two stages of the control or a stoppage of the mind, restraint of the mind. One is called laya, the merger, in which that the vasana potential is still there. Vinashana, the destruction when all the vasanas also are progressively eliminated. 
Zayagatam punarbhavati. Second line says, Zayagatam punarbhavati no bhutam. No means what? There is this Sanskrit no and English no. This no is the product of the merger of two letters. Na plus u becomes no. The u means definitely. So no means definitely not. Na means English no. But na u, the Sanskrit no means definitely not. No mrutam, mrutam. Mrutam means what? The mind that is destroyed. You see it? Vasanaksha manonasha. The exhaustion of vasanas and the destruction of the mind. So mrutam manaha. The mind that is destroyed. What is the mind destroyed? When no vasanas remain. Punar bhavati. Then that mind does not arise at all. It remains in the state where there is no further thought. <clears throat> the idea is that even the yoga does not mean that destruction of mind is destruction of mind in a physical sense. But when the mind is made free of all the vasanas, then that mind becomes a very, uh, what should we call it, becomes now a a very favorable mind. It is like removing fangs from a snake. Remove that poison from the snake. Snake remains as far as appearance is concerned. But the snakeness no more remains. So mind remains. But the mind as a binding thing does not remain. So, Yoga Shastra also by Manonasa, destruction of mind, do not mean that the mind as an entity gets destroyed. Because then you can't exist. For a person to live and function, the person requires mind. But what is destroyed in the mind? That binding aspect is destroyed, or vasanas are destroyed, or habitual patterns are destroyed. And the mind is established in the enlightenment. That I am awareness. So that enlightened mind is what the yogi has. <clears throat> so Lagatam Punar Bhavati, meaning the mind which is just merged still remains bound. No Mrutam, the mind that is destroyed, no more remains bound. The mind that is simply merged wakes up again in the bondage. The mind that is destroyed does not, no more wakes up in the bondage. <clears throat> so how do you attain that state called the uh, destruction of the mind or destruction of asanas when the mind becomes completely innocent? Com you know, how do you get that? So verse 14 tells us that. Pranabandhana lina manasam Eka chintana nashametyada Pranabandhana lina manasam Manas on the mind that is rhythm, that is merged, pranabandhanat, by the restraint of the breath, pranayama. So, earlier we were told how the pranayama helps us to, I mean, enables us to achieve a state called merger of the mind. When the prana stops, the mind also stops. That is the merger of the mind. So, pranabandhanat dhinamanasam, what you can achieve by restraining of the breath is the merger of the mind, not the enlightenment of the mind. Because prana cannot remove the vasanas. The vasanas still have to be removed. 
Now, according to Yoga Shastra, how do you remove asanas? By repeated practice of samadhi. Abhyasa and vairagya. Abhyasa means repeating something. Vairagya means dispassion. So, by the repeated practice of that samadhi and by the vairagya, meaning making the mind free from ragadveshas, slowly and slowly, by that abhyasa, by that practice, progressively, mind becomes free from vasanas. <clears throat> so, a deliberate attempt is there. That whenever the mind displays any kind of an impulse, you neutralize it by pratipaksha bhavana. So, how do you make your mind free from vasanas? By pratipaksha bhavana. Meaning by the attitude of deliberately taking the opposite position. For example, there is an impulse of anger in the mind. So we need to, that is the result of vasana. Anger is an impulse, a habitual response. Because of built-in pattern. When I see something I can't tolerate, then right away I react. So that impulse, all impulses are the result of vasanas. So when an impulse, such as anger arises, that means vasana is there. What's a vasana? Intolerance. Anger is the result of intolerance. So, vasana or pattern of intolerance is there, which is what brings about the reaction in the form of anger. So, what do I do? I now introduce a new pattern of tolerance. So, intolerance has to be neutralized by a deliberate attitude of tolerance. How can you tolerate this person, Swamiji? Look at the behavior. Look at the how. So that meaning that we do have the reason to get angry because the person is like that according to our in our perception. How can you tolerate? Well, deliberately see that aspect in that person which enables you to accept that person. So, person does have this behavior, cantankerous behavior, whatever kind of behavior is there, which makes us angry, which pushes our button. But that is not the whole person. That's a part of the person. In that person, now and then you also see kindness, goodness, compassion. So, those virtues also are seen now and then. So I make my mind deliberately see that person possessed of that virtue. I, I make, I in my mind I create the picture of how that person was kind under given conditions. Swamiji has never been kind to me. But then he may be kind to somebody, hopefully, you know, somebody. So, I bring in my mind deliberately a picture of a kind person, kind towards a child, kind towards a friend, kind towards somebody. So, picture of cruelty is displaced by picture of kindness. Because both are there. The thing is that everybody is potentially a good, kind, loving person. It's there for us to see. But when we react, we can't see the whole person. We see only part of the person and then we take it to the whole and then we react. So I, I display a two-step response. One-step response is an impulsive response. Two-step response is a deliberate response. An impulsive response is to submit myself to my impulse and react. The deliberate response is that I, I keep under check my impulse. I step back and make my mind see the opposite. So whatever has created a reaction in me, namely this person's behavior, 
I make my mind see the opposite because that is also there in that person. Raga attachment arises because of seeing one part of a thing. When I keep on thinking about virtues of something, then attachment arises. Dvesha, aversion also arises because of thinking of one part of the thing. When I keep on dwelling upon the vices of a thing, then dvesha or aversion arises. But whatever is created is a combination of virtue and vice. Nothing is perfect and nothing is totally useless. So where the vices are, virtues are going to be there. Where the virtues are, vices are going to be there. So if my mind gets attached because of seeing virtues, I make it see the vice. If my mind hates because of seeing the vice, I make it see the virtue. You see, this is the Pratipaksha Bhavana. This has to be done, understand. This is the process of Vasanakshaya. Making our mind free from the tendencies of impulses. Vasana is a tendency for reaction. That a vasana is there is known from the reaction. Reaction is a manifest state of vasana. And vasana is the unmanifest state of reaction. You understand? So that I have vasana becomes known to me only when I see reaction in my mind. Thus, every reaction enables me to learn something about my mind. So, use that occasion to learn something about the mind. Otherwise, what happens? I get angry, I get angry at myself, I get angry at anger. So, I lose the opportunity of learning from that occasion. So, you are angry. Learn from that. What made me angry? What is it that I cannot tolerate? I will learn. And I will be able to train my mind for tolerance. So thus, un- understanding mind is extremely important. And every reaction gives me an opportunity to learn something about the mind. So we use that occasion and try to neutralize the reaction. That this constantly has to be done. This is the process of Vasana Akshaya. As Vasanas are exhausted, the potential of reactions, of restlessness also becomes less and less. Mind becomes more and more quiet. No Vasanas, totally quiet. So Vasana Akshaya and Manunasa, both of them take place together, but each one helps the other one. What is Manonasha? Manonasha is when the mind doesn't have any desires and stuff like that. Mind has no extrovertedness. So whenever mind goes out, I make the mind see the futility of what it is going out for. It's Vairagya. Bring it back. So Vairagya enables me to make my mind bring back and this Pratipaksha Bhavana enables me to make my mind free from reactions. You see two pro- twofold process. Manonasha and Vasanakshaya. So practicing again and again. The Pratipaksha Bhavana is for Vasanakshaya. And practicing again and again. The Vairagya is to make the mind free from extrovertedness. So, Manonasha, destruction of mind is freedom of the mind from extrovertedness. And Vasana Akshaya is freedom of mind from potential reactions. So, you have to do that. Whether you are a yogi or a Vedantian or whoever you are, this has to be done. Understand. So, when Arjuna asks this question, O oh Lord, my mind is restless. And turbulent and strong and obstinate. And I find that controlling the mind is as difficult or more difficult than controlling the, eh, the wind. <coughs> so Lord Krishna says, I understand. 
असंशयम महाबाहो मनो दुर्निग्रह चरम हे महाबाहो ओ माइथियाम अर्जुन माइथियाम पर्सन ऑल्सो बिकम्स हेल्पलेस विद द माइंड यू नो अ माइथी पर्सन इन द वर्ल्ड बिकम्स हेल्पलेस एट होम यू नो सो इन इंडिया पीपल हैव दिस नेम सिंह 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 मींस लायन सो मोहन सिंह शक्ति सिंह दिस सिंह लायन so somebody asked this person yeah, you are a lion when you are out here what happens when you go home <laughs> now this also requires some cultural knowledge he says when i go home when durga starts riding on me so durga <laughs> durga is the goddess and lion is her vehicle so when i go home and durga starts riding on me so however mighty you may be the mind rides on you however mighty a person may be he is still very often a slave of the mind let's you to release ourselves from the slavery so then lord krishna said i understand but in this arjuna abhyas in the common the vairagya se bolte by abhyas and vairagya it is possible to bring the mind under control there also nigruh grihyade or nigruhyade mano nigrah is what lord krishna talks about in the sixth chapter anyway so as we said abhyas repeated practice of this pratipaksha bhavana for releasing the mind from internal impulses and repeated practice of vairagya for making the mind free from its extrovertness so vasanaksha and what is manonaasha freedom from extrovertness what is vasanaksha freedom from all impulses now you can imagine that mind that is a perfect mind the mind that you want to have and yoga says that by practice of the samadhi you ultimately achieve that mind <coughs> But the fourteen verse said, "Prana bandhana lien man sam." That merely merger of the mind is not adequate. You need something else. Ek achintana na shameetya da. This mind becomes na na shameeti, gains distraction by ek achintana by chintanam or contemplation upon one. so we'll continue that discussion in our next class om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamada ya purnameva vashishyate om shanti shanti शांति हरि ओ श्री गुरुभ्यो नमः